Welcome to the Electric Wire podcast. We bring you news and views on the most pressing issues facing Wisconsin's electric industry from policymakers, executives, and customer and environmental advocates. Bringing you these discussions, we are the Customers First Coalition. Here's your host, Executive Director Kristen Jilks. Welcome back, Electric Wire listeners. We are releasing this podcast on November 8th, Election Day. So let this be your reminder to go vote if you haven't already. Today, we're happy to bring you an episode about public power and municipal electric utilities specifically. You'll remember from our last episode, which focused on investor-owned utilities, that The Energy Information Administration, or EIA, classifies utilities into three ownership types, investor-owned utilities, publicly run utilities, such as municipal utilities, and electric cooperatives. Investor-owned utilities, or IOUs, are large electric distributors that issue stock owned by shareholders. Electric cooperatives, or co-ops, are not-for-profit, member-owned, and member-governed electric utilities. We'll focus on co-ops in our next episode. And today, we're here to learn more about publicly owned utilities, specifically municipally run utilities, as Wisconsin is home to 81 cities, towns, and villages that own and operate a municipal electric utility. These municipal utilities are organized together under the Municipal Electric Utilities of Wisconsin, or MEUW, and we have Tim Heinrich, President and CEO of MEUW, and Tyler Vorpagel, Director of Government Affairs, here as a part of our panel. Also joining our panel are representatives from three public power utilities across the state, Troy Adams, General Manager of Manitowoc Public Utilities, Jill Weiss, Utilities Director at Stoughton Utilities, and Rick Wickland, who is the general manager of Sun Prairie Utilities. In this episode, you'll learn a little bit more about how joint action agencies such as WPPI Energy and Great Lakes Utilities help to provide power supply and services to these municipal utilities. And you can rest assured that we will be devoting time on a future podcast episode to discuss much more about joint action agencies as well. Now I'll turn you over to my discussion with our panel of representatives from municipally owned utilities. Welcome to our panel, and I will turn it over to each of you to give me a little bit of background on yourself and how you got interested in this industry. Tim, I'll start with you. Thanks, Kristen. So uh, next spring, I'll actually have been in the industry for 30 years, and I started right out of college and had an opportunity to work for an electric company in Iowa and uh, just really have found the industry to be one that uh, really matches my values and is something that I've really come to enjoy. You know, electricity is something that everybody needs and uh, it's nice to be part of an industry that's essential. So uh, I've been around the industry for almost 30 years, worked for an investor owned utility for 25 of those years and joined MEUW back in the spring of 2018 uh, and have been uh, serving as the head of the organization since that time. So coming up on uh, four and a half years here. So. It seems like just yesterday, Tim. It does. Thanks. Let's move on to Tyler Vorpagel. Tyler, welcome and tell us about yourself and your first couple months on the job. Yeah, speaking of just yesterday, um, that that seems like uh, about when I started here at uh, MUW, I was uh, hired as the Director of Legislative and Regulatory Relations at MUW and started in June. Previous to being at MUW, I was uh, in the state legislature from Plymouth, Uh, so my district includes Plymouth, Keele, uh, the north side of Sheboygan, and have been a municipal utility customer just about my uh, entire life, and just really enjoyed the what MEUW uh, is, the the uh, communities that we serve, and just it's been a great couple of weeks to get around and uh, interact and work with our our member utilities and highlight their. Um, and be advocates for for them uh, in the capital of Madison. Thanks, Tyler. We'll move on now to Troy Adams from Manitowoc Public Utilities. Hi, Troy. Hello. So I've only been in at Manitowoc in Wisconsin for about two and a half years. I, I moved over here during the pandemic due to retirement, my predecessor. Prior to that, I'd worked 
in Minnesota in public power. I worked for Elk River Municipal Utilities since 2006 and had been really active with the state association there. But that's not really how I went. It wasn't that easy. I had worked as a consulting engineer for years. And when I had moved up to the Twin Cities uh, and met my now wife, her father had worked for NSP his entire life and insisted that I needed to get into the electric utility world and would cut out ads from the paper and say, you should, re- you should apply for this job. He had been a, a trouble lineman and really believed in, in the industry. And, and I ended up applying for a job in, in Elk River, which is just outside the Twin Cities, where my wife had graduated high school and got an engineering manager position there. And then the the GM left it two years later and I was able to get that promotion. So my my path into public power wasn't really as I had intended or it wasn't real intentional, I guess. Uh, But what I found out right away is that it resonated with my value system. There's something really powerful, pun intended, about working in an industry and especially in a sector of an industry where there aren't shareholders, your customers are your owners, you're making decisions for their best interests. And that really, uh, like I said, resonates with me. And I, I feel really good about being in this industry. Thanks, Troy. And electricity puns are always welcome here on the electric wire. Rick, let's go to you. How long have you been at Sun Prairie Utilities? Um, I've been at Sun Prairie Utilities since 2003. So 19 years, um, probably uh, it's between 15 and 16 in my present role as utility manager. Um, I also did a stint at uh, Commonwealth Edison, which is now Exelon in Illinois, for about seven years um, back in the 1990s. And uh, in addition to that, relative to the utility industry, also was with Cooper Power Systems, manufacturer of transformers and other equipment for the industry um, for three years. So spent uh, a lot of time. I would echo uh, what Troy said about uh, the value of coming to a municipal public uh, power utility in that uh, you're really close to your customers. It seems like you mean something and you're doing a great thing on behalf of, uh, of all the residents you serve. Um, and you're, uh, you're, you're just something, you, you become, uh, become part of the community. Um, you're a resource for everybody to go to. And, and I think that's, uh, that's really something special about the communities we serve. Look forward to helping out. And, in any way, shape, or form. So Great. Thanks, Rick. Hi, Jill. How about you? Hi. My path is probably a little bit unique in the sense that I'm a civil engineer. So um, actually, from a utility standpoint, worked in private sector and uh, municipal sector for water and sewer and kind of started there, um, but I had the opportunity to expand in the electric area and had the opportunity actually to work for an investor owned as well as uh, two different municipal utilities. But as I would echo everything that's been shared here already is the it's so powerful to be a part of, um, you know, municipal not-for-profit um, utilities where you're helping your neighbors, you're helping our customers and everything that we do. So it's been really rewarding that way. And we try to, you know, of course, move forward in every direction that we can to help our customers. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> okay. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you each what makes your community unique and your municipal electric utility unique. But Tim, I want you to give us a background on what is MEUW, what do you stand for, and how do you help the municipal utilities operate? Municipal Electric Utilities of Wisconsin is a trade association. We've been around since 1928. And we were actually formed at a time when there was some debate happening at the Capitol and uh, a group of enterprising individuals really felt like municipal utilities weren't being represented in those conversations. And so uh, that group uh, ended up coming together and suggested that they form an association and become an advocate for the municipal utilities in the state. So today, in almost 95 years, we've grown to uh, provide the services and advocacy and support that we do for 81 municipal utilities across the state, ranging in size from the smallest that serves just around 500 customers to um, uh, the largest, which is just over 18,000 customers. All total, there are about 300,000 municipal electric customers in the state of Wisconsin. Um, And so 
Emma UW is proud to represent all of them. And uh, we not only provide that support in terms of advocacy and understanding the issues and helping explain municipal utilities to uh, those outside of our, our organizations, but we also uh, provide services to those municipal utilities. So we are the safety arm of our municipal utilities. Our staff at MUW is responsible for the training of all the line workers across the state that work for a municipal utility. We also have a, a compliance program that we offer to municipalities. And more recently, we've also gotten into the, the space of providing leadership training, recognizing that there's some transitions happening in our industry and uh, we've got turnover happening. And so the association has taken a role in really trying to create that next generation of leaders to continue the legacy of, of municipal utilities across the state. Perfect, thank you. And I'm so happy that we have representatives from three of the municipalities themselves from across the state. And so I do wanna hear a little bit more about the communities that each of you serve and how you think municipal power fits in with the values of your community. Rick, do you wanna start us off on this one? Sure, I'm with Sun Prairie Utilities. So I guess historically, I always think we're going to slow down and become one of the one of the slower growing communities, but that just hasn't happened since I've gotten here. I don't think so. In the last 20 years, we we continue to be the most rapidly one of the most rapidly growing. Um, we're second as far as customer base um, of the municipalities in Wisconsin for electric service. We continue to uh, continue to be heavily residential. I mean, there there is some some commercial involvement, but we're we're uh, we're heavily residential and uh, and really reach out. See the importance of the residential customer services is probably our primary focus. What do you think when you think of new and emerging technologies? Do you think Sun Prairie is is a leader in the state on some of these new technologies like electric vehicles, smart thermostats? Do you have any programs around that that you feel are unique to Sun Prairie? Well, we're in the process of uh, of I think creating a a program for definitely electric vehicles. We're looking at it closely. Uh, we do have uh, probably the largest portion of electric vehicles of the municipalities just because of our location um, right outside of Madison and being uh, close to interstates 90, 94 and 151. So uh, that's, that, that's definitely something we're focusing on and looking at. Um, Wanakee actually is in the process of getting electric vehicle, uh, kind of an electric vehicle rate put in place and uh, and once they do, I think we will we will follow up. But we see a significant uh, significant amount of customers that are that are getting electric vehicles. Rooftop solar is a big deal too. Um, a lot of residential rooftop solar that we we have to be involved in and, and stay atop of in the industry. Great, thanks, Rick. Jill, let's jump down to Stoughton, and I'm interested to hear from you. What makes Stoughton unique, and the relationship you have with the community there? Stoughtons are we're, we're very proud, proud of our community. We've got a Norwegian heritage and very much helping neighbor to neighbor um, mentality. We're very green minded. Um, we actually just got news today that we're eighth in the, con in the county, excuse me, eighth in the country for green power participation. We usually rank um, ninth or tenth, and this year we actually made eighth and we're at 4.8 percent. We've also got a large um, rural territory in which we service. We service the city of uh, Stoughton, but we also have four townships that we provide service to as well. So we've got about 55 square miles uh, that is our service territory. It's kind of unique, I guess, to some degree, as far as a lot of municipal utilities, you know, service the, the community and maybe a little bit larger area than that. Um, we've got a very large service um, territory that extends into the townships. You mentioned green pricing. Could you tell me a little bit more about what green pricing is and how many of your customers are opting into that? We do, yeah, green power participation is kind of how it's being referenced, but we all, we have a choose renewable, re, choose renewable program where actually we just, um, through our partnership with WPPI Energy, we actually changed the energy blocks. So they're $2 per uh, 300 kilowatts. And so our customers can participate in that program and actually get that pricing so if they want to actually have their power as opposed to say putting solar panels on the roof or um, doing something you know specifically at their property, they're able to participate in this program and actually get um, have their power come from renewable resources. That's really exciting. Thanks, Jill. All right, Troy, moving up to Manitowoc. Tell us more. Manitowoc is the largest municipal electric utility in the state. So I guess that makes us 
unique. We do have generation, which also I think makes us unique. Uh, lots of municipals started with generation. Not a lot have kept them over their lifespan. We have two fossil fuel fired boilers uh, that we're converting to run on renewable fuel. One of the two has already been converted and we've got a combustion turbine as well. Operating that fleet, I think makes us special because we've got those those boilers. We also have a steam and a hot water district, which kind of locks us into continuing down the path of generation. We have pretty large industrial customers that are depending on that. We also provide fiber, a fiber network in town. We do the water and wastewater services as well. When you think about utilities, we're providing just about all the utilities in our community. I have a question. You mentioned renewable fuel and using converting your boilers to run on renewable fuel. What is the process for that? And what is the renewable fuel coming from? So we've actually been using this fuel blended in with fossil fuel for 20 plus years. It's a densified fuel pellet and it's industrial waste local. So the, this is the, a paper region. There's a lot of paper waste pulp and other stuff that ends up just going into the landfill. There are a few pelletizing companies in the area that take that and press it with other waste product. It's not municipal solid waste, it's all industrial waste, so it's clean. It's been certified by the state as renewable and it's got pretty similar BTUs as coal. So it ends up being a really great direct replacement for, for coal. Uh, so we've converted one of the two boilers we have to run exclusively on this renewable fuel. We've been doing it since last December, and now we're working on converting the other. Very interesting. Rick, Jill, Tim, did you want to comment any more about how municipal utilities either generate electricity or how you get generation or power delivered to you? We actually don't at Stoughton Utilities. We don't uh, generate any of our own electricity. We actually have a purchase agreement with WPPI Energy, and it's we're part of 51 other communities that actually municipal utilities that come together and purchase power. And so that's actually how we provide um, power. So there's actually a very diverse portfolio um, that is board members, and we're all board members as part of that organization, uh, participate and determine what that portfolio ultimately looks like and purchase our power that way. And then um, is a wholesale and then retail back to our customers. I think that's really helpful in explaining where WPPI and joint, joint action agencies fit in here in helping coordinate some of the power supply purchases for municipal utilities. Rick, did you want to say anything more on that? Yeah, just a WPPI, that's, that was why they were created back in 1980 was, to, it was for the specific purpose of uh, um, buying or generating, getting the generation sources whereby which we're all served, all 51 communities are served with that power that they provide. Uh, coincidentally, then afterwards, then they provide a significant number of other services to all the members, um, depending on, on what's needed. But, but their value is it, it was primarily and still to this day maintains primarily to um, create the generation force for us. And uh, that, that involves um, buying into um, solar resources, um, wind resources, um, we have nuclear power, and uh, and those are the those are just some of the some of the green initiatives and generation sources that we are supplied with. Kristen, if I might, I just that I think it's a nice segue to the fact that one of the questions I get a lot is, you know, where did municipal utilities come from, and you know why why do they exist? And and I appreciate the fact that you're focusing this series on the different operating models of of utilities in the state, because a lot of people don't understand that, or, you know, they they understand the model they're used to because they pay a bill to their utility, but they might not really uh, understand that there are three models. And so really, if you go back in history, the, the municipal utilities were created, uh, and in Wisconsin, the oldest one was formed in 1890 in New Richmond, Wisconsin. 
But they were formed because the, the larger investor-owned utilities didn't want to serve rural parts of the state. And so a lot of enterprising individuals at the time said, you know, we want electricity in our community. And so they got together and they did it for themselves. And that's really the roots of public power. And that's, you know, the spirit of public power, this enterprising, entrepreneurial uh, ideal and local service is what we're all about. And, uh, you know, here we are 130 years later, and that is still a principle of, of why we exist and, and how we operate. And it's, an, it's a really important and I think unique feature of municipal utilities. Um, you know, we are all about being local. And, uh, you know, it's a situation where if you're a customer of a municipal utility, chances are you know the lineman in town. Chances are you've interacted with the person who works in the office. Chances are you can go into the office and actually pay your bill if you wanted to. Um, when you call for, because you've experienced an outage as infrequently as that happens, if you call about your outage, the local person is going to know the street you live on and they've driven by your house. And so it's it's a very special model. And I think one that's you know hard to come by in, in this uh, fast paced society. There's really a, a lot to be said about municipal utilities. I love your passion for what you do, Tim. Thank you for that. Tyler, I know you mentioned you were just recently brought on as you've been learning more about municipal utilities and some of the advantages of being a public power community. How are you using that to add advocate at the Capitol? Yeah, so we're in the process of engaging with a lot of our managers and, you know, the folks who are our are, are boots on the ground and getting them to get to know their local legislators. Um, we just had a, a good opportunity, 40 uh, workers from about 20 different municipalities in Wisconsin uh, went down to Florida for a, about a week to help with uh, recovery efforts down there. So uh, using that as an opportunity to engage with the state representatives and let them know, hey, one of the things that we do is, is mutual aid and coordinate uh, mutual aid when there are issues and get a chance to bring those folks in our area, let them know what public power is, why we exist, and give them the opportunity to ask questions. And uh, I'll put a plug in and, and Tim, feel free to jump if there's anything I forget, but uh, next year we'll be celebrating our 95th anniversary and uh, plan on doing a number of events around that, uh, including a bucket truck parade down East Washington uh, and doing some uh, events in the Capitol, again, just to highlight who we are, who we serve and the value that we provide to our customers. That sounds fun. I need an invite to that parade. Maybe, I mean, <laughs> For if, you sure. need, if you need anyone to ride along on a bucket truck, I volunteer. You can drive one. Say. Awesome. <laughs> And we definitely can can get you in a bucket truck. <laughs> That's so exciting. Okay, Tim, earlier you mentioned Public Power has about 300,000 customers being served across the state. Can you help us understand what is a customer? I know sometimes we say customers and that's actual meters. So it's not simply 300,000 people in the state being served by municipal utilities. The number is actually much larger than that. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to clarify that. We, we do have 300,000 municipal utility electric meters across the state of Wisconsin. And those service uh, what we believe by population estimates is around 500,000 uh, actual customers. So, um, you know, we serve about a half a million uh, people. We keep the lights on for a half a million people and homes and businesses across the state of Wisconsin. What, what we know from our data too is that the average, the, the typical population of, of a municipal utility community is around 3,200 people. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the smallest is around 500 and the population for others goes up, you know, uh, Manitowoc, for example, uh, the community there uh, has about 34,000 people that live there. So 18,000 meters in Manitowoc, but 34,000 people who benefit from being part of uh, municipal utility service. Thank you for that. As we're talking about customers, I wanted to hear from each of you. I think what I've heard from this conversation is that you're really very close to your customers in the communities you serve. 
what do you hear back from your customers and how are you helping keep customer bills affordable during this time when people are talking about skyrocketing electric rates? Um, we just try to educate. Um, one, we try to educate as far as why the bills are so high and then um, everything they can possibly do to try to reduce those, you know, reduce their consumption. So if they can um, have more manageable um, bills, but just try to, again, be engaged, make sure that they know that they, our customers know that we're here to help them. And if they've got questions, that we're here to be able to respond to them. Um, but again, I think awareness is a big part of it. Thanks, Jill. I'd agree. That's a, we, we kind of do the same thing. There are, um, there are a few different avenues that we send customers to. There's energy services, there's urban triage, and um, we also partner with Sunshine Place within the city of Sun Prairie. Um, our utilities commission has approved uh, providing an, an extra 25,000 that we can use towards helping with customer bills. Coincidentally, even though the prices are the, the highest right now, we have the lowest past due that we've had since the pandemic. So in over two years, so we're actually, actually in pretty good shape, but it does make a difference to, we try and reach out and be proactive in communication letting the customers know um, that, that these are unique times and uh, and trying to help them out in any way we can. Troy, did you want to add more on that? I agree with everything said, that engagement and uh, educating customers, it, it's critical. You know, rates matter. I would say that if you were to survey our customers in Mantuoc, rates are the most important thing because there's an expectation of safety and reliability. If they realize those could go away, I'm, I'm sure safety and reliability would be the top two, but because those are expected, rates are the most important thing. So I talked about this refueling of our power plant to be renewable. We're doing it because it's going to lower cost and it helps to kind of mitigate future risk because it's going to be less carbon intense than fossil fuel. But rates are always on the front of our decision making. When, when we're trying to help customers with the high rates, especially right now, yes, we're communicating what's happening, but also we're making decisions that we're very mindful of cost when we're making decisions for, for the long term. You know, the power agencies that we work with, like WPPI and Great Lakes Utilities, are working to try and blend and create favorable price structures for us, you know, with MPU where we own generation, we're trying to use that to lower costs for our, our customers. MPU serves quite a lot of industrial customer too. So their expectations are different than residential. And in the end, it, they're all important for the community. You need the jobs. People need to be able to power their homes. So it's a little bit of everything. you got to think about how the rates impact everyone. If I could just jump in here too, I think one of the things that <clears throat> these guys are being quite humble about is, is the idea that, you know, just the fact that municipal utilities exist and serve customers is one way that we're helping customers uh, control their costs. We are not, we are focused 100% on serving customers. We aren't subject to providing a return to shareholders. And I think that's just a, a really important part of the model that helps us to keep our costs low. Uh, we recognize that that customers don't want to pay more than they need to. And so the fact that we are only uh, beholden to and, and serving local customers who are our neighbors it is a, an important part of the public power model. Not to mention the fact that um, when there is an opportunity, when we have to increase rates, uh, it's it's all about the, the the local control, the local decision making. Um, you know, the people that are making that recommendation for a rate increase are the folks that are sitting on the city council or on a utility commission in in their community, and they recognize that the decisions they're making impact their neighbors as well as themselves. And so uh, it's just a, a really important hallmark of public power. Before we finish up here, Tim, I wanted you to elaborate on, on one additional detail. You talked about the local decision making, and I wanted to make sure for our listeners, municipal utilities are also regulated by the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin, which is somewhat unique here in Wisconsin. There's other states where it's simply governed by uh, the local governing body. But here in Wisconsin, municipal utilities are governed at the PSC as well. Yeah, so we really have uh, two, la two layers of oversight in terms of our operations as a municipal utility. Again, it's all local. 
Uh, it really become it really starts locally. It's the people that are serving on that city council or village board or on that utilities commission that's part of that community that are making these decisions. But ultimately, then there's the oversight that comes um, from the public service commission and recognizing that uh, we have an obligation to serve and that we are regulated at that level to provide the consistency that, that comes with the oversight that a, a state agency provides. Um, but as you mentioned, that is not true of every municipal utility across the country. It is a, a unique aspect of utility regulation in Wisconsin. And I'll just jump in here. In my, my previous utility in Minnesota, municipals were not regulated by the Public Utility Commission. So that was a big change for me to come here and lose that part of local control. You know, it was during the pandemic, decisions were being made about customer debt and, and how to steer the utility going forward. And to change your rates, you don't do that locally. So that was that was a little bit of a shock for me to to play in that that different world. And I see the value for the regulation that protects the customer. And so I can respect that, but it is slower, a slower process to, to bring something new. And I would say for Mantuac, we want to look at things like solar programs and electric vehicle programs and all those things require us to go back through a process. And so it's not as quick as what I had been used to. So how do you feel that municipal utilities are staying on the forefront of new technologies like electric vehicles, smart thermostats, and distributed energy resources. Troy, do you want to start us out? I feel like there's some misunderstanding, misconception about what municipal utilities are doing or can do. The average size of a municipal utility being 2,000 or, or fewer meters, people think that we're not going to be as forward looking and be more reactive. Uh, and that, that's just not true. Municipal utilities are involved in all of those things. Mantuoc has electric vehicle charging. We have rebates for in-home electric vehicle chargers. We're working on a smart thermostat rollout. We just got a tariff passed for community solar. All of those things we've been working on right along step in step with the uh, the bigger IOUs and the, and the co-ops. That's great, Troy. Rick or Jill or Tim, did you want to add anything else there? I'll just add the fact that I think, you know, one of the things that we hear from the Public Service Commission every now and then is that, you know, they're, they're really interested in pilot projects and that they're looking for opportunities to kind of see how things work. And municipal utilities are a unique uh, opportunity for those types of projects. And, um, you know, we are by nature small. And so if you want to do a pilot, it's easy to pick a community and pilot a project there. Um, and so, you know, I think we're always looking to be part of those opportunities. And, you know, maybe it's an opportunity for the Public Service Commission to, to, to think differently as well about the kinds of projects they want to drive and to start thinking about, you know, what community could we target as an opportunity to check this out and see whether it resonates with customers. Um, and that instead of us always bringing ideas to the Public Service Commission, that they come to us as an opportunity to drive a, a particular initiative or, or try something. Um, again, by nature, we are we we can be that pilot group. I would agree, just based on our, our location of the three representatives we have from the municipalities of Manitowoc, Stowe, and then some Prairie, just our location uh, allows us to be, we're in general looked at as progressive communities in the areas that we serve. And, uh, and our residents reach out to us and we know that we know and want to provide the best services possible for them. That's really cool. Thanks everyone. The last question, which we ask all of our guests is if you had all the power in the industry, what would you do with it? And Tim, I'm going to start with you first. Well, naturally, I would I would convert every investor-owned utility to a, to a municipal. I mean, why wouldn't we? It's it's a wonderful model. Uh, it works very effectively, and um, you know, it, it's it's really it benefits the customer. Um, it's it, you know, it's it's ironic that we're on a podcast here that's sponsored by customers first, because really, if you think about it, municipal utilities that is our mantra: customers first. And uh, in fact, it's customers only. 
really. I mean, we're not, again, getting back to what I said earlier, this isn't about trying to drive profits or, or make shareholders happy. Um, we are very focused on the customer and our communities, and uh, it just really makes it a great opportunity to, to take advantage of, of, of the services that we're able to provide and, and deliver that local service that, that people really appreciate. Thank you, Tim. And we are very happy to have MUW as a founding member of the Customers First Coalition. It's been a good partnership. Tyler, I'll go to you next. What would you do with all the power? Well, I would say uh, somehow get a baseline of uh, knowledge of the different models directly teleported right into uh, incoming legislators' brains right in the beginning. Uh, the difference between what municipally owned utilities are, what uh, investor owned utilities, and then uh, cooperatives. But uh, then I'd be out of a job. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what this podcast is for, Tyler. <laughs> That's why we're here. Well, I, I completely understand. And that's why we wanted to do this series, because I know as legislators are expected to know a lot of information and the electric utility industry can be complex. And so that's why we just want to help break it down a little bit, put a face with the name of some of the communities you all serve and happy to Happy to help in your goal, Tyler. Exactly. All right, Troy, how about you? I'm going to go back to my opening comments about value system and municipal utilities, public power being very in tune with servant leadership. And I think if I had all the power, I would provide enlightenment for all. You know, kind of similar to what Tim was saying, only I'm stopping short of, of converting IOUs. I, I would just like to be able to have people understand the the, the value of public power. I wanted to ask, and I think as we talk about the the value and your role in the community, how long has Manitowoc Utilities actually been serving customers? 1914, but the, the utility was in existence before the city purchased it, which I think is kind of an interesting thing that there was a you know, business person that saw the need, stepped up, and then eventually the city had taken that over and provided that as a, as a service to the city. Cool. I love the history lessons here. Jill, do you know what you would do with all the power? I guess I'm doing this for everybody else that you've really spoken about. I mean, we're here for the community. We're here for our customers. So, you know, further be able to help and support our communities and our customers and to really get that message out to the importance of public power. Um, as far as longevity, I was just looking now, uh, we've been here for 130 years. We actually just celebrated um, that anniversary. So, you know, want to continue that forward and uh, to continue to support our community and our customers and for all of us at municipal utilities to be able to do that. Well, congratulations. That's a pretty yeah. impressive number. Rick, how about you? What would you do with all the power? I'd make it so we never had territorial issues with our adjacent investor-owned utilities. That's kind of said tongue-in-cheek because I'm the last one to, to lose a, a battle and stuff. But but it is truly important where uh, we, we pay a significant payment in lieu of taxes and we provide a, a service that, uh, that is in the range of can, depending on 15 to 40% less than, uh, than our adjacent utilities. And, uh, and it's really important. And, and I would, we, are, we don't do a very good job oftentimes of touting what we do and, uh, and bragging about ourselves. So I wish there was maybe something that automatically happened on, on behalf of us because we all take a, a large amount of pride in what we do and uh, and we would like that to be known and like for you know everyone to see see that. Thanks, Rick. And thank you to everyone for joining the Electric Wire today. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. Please support our work. You can subscribe to the Electric Wire podcast if you haven't already, and you can follow us on Twitter at The Electric Wire. Thanks also to the members of the Customers First Coalition for supporting this podcast. Our members are Dairyland Power Cooperative, Madison Gas and Electric, the Municipal Electric Utilities of Wisconsin, WPPI Energy, the Citizens Utility Board, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 2150, and the Wisconsin Electric Cooperatives Association. Thanks again for listening. We'll have a new episode next month.